you're listening to A Second Look on The Orca. A Second Look is an opportunity for all of us to reflect on past events, unpack their significance, and discuss their long-term implications. A Second Look is intended to give thoughtful reflection on issues that made the headlines and elicited strong responses as a society. What did we think then? What do we think now? What have we learned? And now, your host, Justin Goodrich. Welcome to another edition of A Second Look here on the Orca.ca. I'm your host, Justin Goodrich. On this month's edition of A Second Look, I'm joined by McLean Kay, Editor-in-Chief of The Orca. Together, we'll be taking a second look at 2021, specifically two years of living with the coronavirus. Welcome to the program, McLean. Justin, thank you so much for having me. This is fun. This, you know, this is really fun and uh, been at it a year now and still very thankful for, uh, for you reaching out and inviting me to be part of your team. It, uh, it really is. It really is awesome. Well, I mean, not to get our listeners in on what we talk about off air, but we were just talking about, I, I love the show. To me, it's fascinating. It's a real sort of like Sunday morning cup of coffee, good listen and uh, deep thinking kind of uh, podcast. And um, I'm just thrilled that you wanted me to be on it. Very cool. Very cool. Well, let's dive right into it then, McLean. Um, taking a look back, taking a second look at 2021, I mean, the top news story of the year, of course, coronavirus. On December 31st, 2019, was the first reported case of uh, coronavirus, which, of course, we generally refer to as COVID-19. Uh, that was the, the, the date that the first, uh, first incident was confirmed. In the following weeks, the virus began spreading obviously all around the world. So as we take a second look as, uh, as to how we've been impacted by the pandemic as a society, I'm wondering, do you remember what was going through your mind at the time when, when, we first, when you first heard of this, this coronavirus? And, and I mean, was it curiosity? Was it concern, fear? Just what were some of your thoughts and emotions? The two specific moments come to mind when the, the, the really early days. And the first is, uh, just like you say, at the very beginning, when the first reports of uh, some strange new flu-like disease were being, uh, were being observed in China. And my first thoughts went to SARS and um, the, that scare, which um, I don't want to diminish um, because it did scare and, uh, well, not just scare, it, uh, people died in, in Toronto. But, you know, for those of us in Western Canada, it didn't really affect us much. And I think that's how I both consciously and subconsciously thought this would go. What we still just called coronavirus is it was something to watch and it was scary. Um, but that, you know, the, the relative isolation of Western Canada would prove to be our salvation once again. And, uh, and we'd be just fine. Um, a few weeks uh, later, um, this really stands out for me. Uh, during the budget lockup, the provincial budget with uh, then Finance Minister Carol James, and this happens um, sort of mid-February. Uh, so it'll be about a, just like three weeks before things really got serious. And uh, I'll never forget this. The Times columnist reporter, Les Lane, uh, when he gets up to ask a question of, of Minister James, he, his question was something like, have you heard much about this coronavirus thing? And, you know, does that do, do any preparations or anything like that? Does that play any part in your, you know, you're planning a provincial budget? And Minister James' answer was kind of like the rest of Canada's political establishment at the time, which was, no, not really. <laughs> we don't really we don't really see it uh changing things on that level um and that's not to single her out um I, everyone in canada thought that uh sure, I, yeah, of the, course. yeah the federal finance minister would have given you the exact same answer but i mean after the fact it's one of those things you think back on and think wow <laughs> right had <laughs> we, we had we known right were we ever wrong <laughs> yeah so, so let's fast forward then, uh, you know, roughly two and a half months after that, uh, that original case was confirmed, uh, things started uh, to change here in British Columbia. The landscape shifted, companies were sending their employees home, restaurants were shutting down, grocery shelves were suddenly just barren, oh, you know, overnight, um, couldn't find toilet paper to save your life. It was just, it was just insane. So, so at that point, what are you, what are you now thinking and what are you now feeling? And, and not just, you know, not just 
through the lens of McLean K, an individual, but a husband and a father and a, a business owner, I mean, there must have been a lot of thoughts and emotions. Uh, quite a few. Um, and my perspective is a little uh, different, actually, in mm. that um, um, my son, uh, who at the time was five, uh, got really, really sick. Um, uh, in the, I want to say the first, second week of March, this is before everything locked down. Um, but literally just like the week before, and he got sick enough that the, being hospitalized was a real possibility. Um, and he presented what looked very much like flu-like symptoms. And we knew enough about coronavirus at the time that that was actually the thinking. Um, and the, he received the first COVID test um, at, <laughs> at this particular doctor's clinic. I actually watched them go into the back and take it out of the box, open the sealed package. They had never used oh. it before. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Right? And so, I mean, he's one of the first tested in all of Victoria, actually. Um, and um, we were told we'd get the results in a couple days and one way or the other, and we didn't. We didn't get the results for 11 days. Uh, but we were told to um, isolate at home, and we did. Now, this period of what we didn't know would be 11-day isolation, while that happened, that is actually when the province went into lockdown. So we were already... <laughs> in lockdown when the province nice. went into lockdown and for me you know the last day you know driving Ian uh, my son to the doctor's office and the world looks very normal and then when we next emerged you know almost two weeks later you know the streets were empty and there were lineups outside grocery stores and it was it was like something out of a bad movie Justin it was like everything had changed while we weren't we weren't there to see it now we were aware of it having seen it all on tv and that but I mean, for us, we kind of, our, our lockdown started about 10 days earlier than everyone else. Right. <laughs> he was fine and the test came back negative, but. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, what a, what a, what a scary time. I mean, for any parent where a child is ill, that's a scary time. Uh, but, but navigating that in the midst of this whole other thing that is sort of happening all around you, but you can't necessarily even bother to think about that because you're looking after your kid but then as you point out like you sort of emerge from your uh, from your hibernation or your cocoon or whatever after two two weeks and you're like oh wow <laughs> okay <laughs> all right never never stood in line for uh, for toilet paper before <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. No, no exactly now mclean um obviously you're you know you're uh, you're someone who's held senior roles in government uh, and, and someone whose who's pedigree includes media and communications, that's, your, that's your, your trade as a practitioner. And so I, I'm wondering, when you look back at those early days, what are some of the things that the various levels of government did well? And perhaps what are some of the things they could have, they could have done better? If you remember the very early days, um... I mean, I remember, Justin, I'm old enough to remember when um, in the oh, first. No, don't, don't do that. Cause I'm really only just a couple years younger than you. And that makes me feel old too. That's, that's true. <laughs> but I mean, there was a lot of um, what was apparently um, well-intentioned and I'm going to be a little charitable here, uh, especially on the part of, of like federal officials trying to get a hold of, get it, get it in front of what might've been public panic. And so, I mean, they would, they would, you know, closing the borders is actually, it's kind of a racist thing to suggest. Why would you even bring that up? And um, I remember stories of the, the mall in Richmond being empty and, you know, a lot of hand wringing about why aren't people going to the mall in Richmond? It's like, why are we doing this to the Chinese community? And it was just that that community understood, I think, a little earlier than the rest of us exactly what was happening. Um, and so there was a lot of sort of almost shaming of people for, I don't want to call it fear, but just being cautious and saying, well, maybe I'll just sit this one out for a day or two and see what happens, which, you know, with hindsight was exactly the right reaction. And also very understandably, even if it had turned out to be false. Um, those kinds of things, I think, if we go through this again, and I hope that I never do, um, I, I hope that there will not be this risk to condemn people for acting cautiously. Um, especially labeling it with something as ugly as we have enough problems with racism in this country that we don't need to make it, you know, deciding not to go to the mall in, in, uh, in Burnaby or Richmond this weekend is, I mean, that's just silly. Um, that said, I think the province here in BC in the early days did things very well. 
Um, they were very smart in that they decided to make the public face of the pandemic um, the public health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry. Um, we take that as normal here in BC, but that's not doesn't have to be that way. Um, in Ontario, Doug Ford was you know front and center for all the COVID briefings. Um, that there's, there's no law that says it has to just be the equivalent of Dr. Henry, but having it handed off to somebody. Uh, early on, who was, um, well, not just nonpartisan, but perceived as nonpartisan, I think helped immensely. Um, and it also helped enormously that, you know, it, it is Dr. Henry, um, the, the person who is, you know, doesn't raise her voice, is always calm, um, is, she appears to live by, you know, be kind, be calm, be safe, that, that helps a lot. Um, now, if you don't have a Dr. Henry, this is hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah, that's true. And the other thing that I think that um, we also don't appreciate not enough is the role that all of our political leaders played, especially in the early days, uh, where the obviously the NDP <laughs> were, were behind the government's direction, but so were the BC Liberals and so were the BC Greens. And it's all the mark more the remarkable, uh, as I trip over my own words, all the more remarkable when you consider that the government was, you know, hanging on by a single member. Um, there's nothing that said that the BC Liberals, for example, had to play nice. If you look just next door in Alberta, the opposition NDP were vicious in their criticism from day one, and that continues to this day. Um, it may be smart politically, but it's not good for public confidence. Here, both opposition parties took another tack. They decided to work with um, the governing NDP and, and not just in a way of not just getting out of the way. Um, there were MLAs in places like the Okanagan that held joint town halls with the health minister from the other party, um, encouraging people to, you know, be safe and that they've uh, later on for things like vaccination. The level of cooperation was remarkable. And I don't think that um, especially the BC Liberals and BC Greens get enough credit for that. I hope they will uh, one day because it was not smart politically, perhaps, but responsibly and ethically, absolutely the right decision. Well, if the if the duty of a public official is to serve the citizenry, mm -hmm. um, then then it is incumbent of them to put the partisanship aside when it comes to the best interests of of the people that they're elected to serve. And and like you, I was extraordinarily proud to see government and opposition, both opposition parties, come together and say, you know, for the next little bit. We're gonna we're gonna work together. We're gonna do what it takes. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna put the human face on this that it deserves. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to politicking over time, you know, and yeah. and 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 we have two years later. But uh, <laughs> but it, it's uh, I I remember feeling so extraordinarily proud as a British Columbian to see my elected officials, and I agree with you. Um, though though uh, the premier Premier Horgan could have hold a Doug Ford. I agree with you. It's, it was strategic to put Dr. Henry Ford. Going back to one of your earlier comments, though, about uh, those initial days and how people were sort of ostracized if they were being, you know, particularly cautious. And, um, and I, I won't, I won't repeat it on air, but the, the, the language used as to the origin of, of the virus and those yeah. racial, racial undertones, you know, that's been, that's, that's just been so extraordinarily disheartening. And, 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 I'm, you know, I'm just, especially with the racial piece here in Vancouver, where I live, um, Asian hate crime has gone yeah. up by something like 800%. And it's, it's just so demoralizing to see, to see the, you know, the lowest common denominator of society making things worse with, with this hate. So, yeah. And I mean, it's, it, racism never makes sense, but no. I mean, it's a disease. It's not. Yeah. It's we can all get it. Where where it started is only interest only interesting if you're an epidemiologist. For those of us who are just trying to not get it, it doesn't matter if it started in China, in Spain, or you know, next door in in uh, Machosen. It just it makes no difference. No, it really. It really doesn't. It's a little. It's a little asinine uh, the way some of those people have treated that. But uh, but in any event, let's uh, let's let's switch back to a more uh, more positive framing of, of this conversation. <laughs> so so here we are now. Um, just just one 
year or, ju or just shy rather of one year after the first uh, confirmed case, the first COVID-19 vaccine was administered on December 14th, 2020 here in Canada. Uh, now, despite the excitement expressed by, I think, most of the public that there was finally a vaccine that could, you know, significantly reduce the likelihood of either contracting the virus or certainly if you got the virus, uh, you know, reduced risk of, of to, you know, to the, the, the degree to which uh, you could be victimized by the virus and whether you'd have to be hospitalized and, you know, all of those, all of those elements. Uh, but there was, there was, there was this group. Um, from the from from the outset, that weren't particularly keen about the vaccine, and were quite quite vocal about it from from the early days. Now, as someone who's who's uh, covered essentially this divide that we've seen over the over the past year, those who are for vaccines and those who are uh, against it, what are some of your thoughts relative to you know how it's impacted our society? I, I, I've got some of my my own thoughts as to what this division has led to, but you know, you're the one who covers it each and every day. So I'd love uh, for listeners to hear your perspective. <laughs> it's such a complicated issue and um, vaccine. I'm going to call it vaccine hesitancy just because it's a overall term. It's, it's not always hesitancy, but I mean, in Canada, it's I think almost more complicated than it is down South in the United States where it's become largely partisan. Um, and I mean, if you'll remember, it was actually um, Donald Trump was the president when he said something to the effect of, you know, there's going to be a vaccine. And I, I think his administration approved it. And there was a lot of outcry, you know, from sort of the MSNBC type saying, well, I'm not, I'm, that's, this is a rushed vaccine done to, uh, you know, bolster Donald Trump before an election. I'm not going anywhere near that. And of course, things played out differently. Donald Trump lost the election, and then so oh, but, all of a sudden, but did but did he McLean? I mean, did he really? <laughs> <laughs> we just got canceled. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're off the air. But um, to the point, I mean, it, it, there was there is an alternate universe in which he did somehow win, where the you know the the very sort of the fringe left is the anti-vax movement, um, or at least part of it, I should say. So, I mean whether or not you decide to take a vaccine, apparently, in the United States at least, depends on which government approved it, which is a little frightening. In Canada, I don't know that it's that. Um, there is a tendency to portray the anti-vaccine movement as a sort of fringe right-wing phenomenon, and I'm sure there is a significant element of that. But where I live in Victoria, that's just not true. <laughs> I mean, it's Salt Spring Island had one of the lowest vaccine uptakes, uh, uptake rates in, you know, Southern BC for a long time. And that was not Maxime Bernier voters. That was, I, you yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's more complicated than it sometimes gets portrayed. Um, and it's, we've never had to confront this before. We've, we've never had to, you know, it, your vaccine status or your health status has never been anyone's business before and suddenly it had to be and so that you know it was these are awkward conversations by by definition and i i think a lot of people are still kind of wrapping their heads around that i, I think all of us have had that conversation with somebody that we know where you know i don't want to name any names but i've been disappointed talking to people and discovering they're not vaccinated and like what what why what are you thinking what's <laughs> you're smarter than this what's what's going on and yeah it's it's much more widespread than we want to admit in much the same way that people who think that 9 11 was an inside job um that's much more widespread than we want to admit i think polling has it at like 15 percent of canadians which is a huge number Wow. And yeah, that's a shocking number, right? And there's probably some overlap. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. Fair point. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You know, I think, I think what's, uh, what's been so incredibly challenging with this is it is deeply personal and you do have people that you love and respect who, who, you know, take these positions and, you know, some of them, I mean, I'll admit, you know, I, I've, I've known a couple of people who, who have uh, historically had some like very serious health challenges oh, sure. and they're genuinely scared 
uh, and I can understand that. And there are those who, who say if, if uh, part of the scientific method is, is uh, about, um, you know, evaluating things long term, well, only, only time will tell. And so, okay, uh, semi-informed position. I, I think there's, I, you know, I, I think there's a thousand and one reasons why, why vaccines, um, you know, are, are, we're, we're at a point with vaccines in our history where we have a good faith basis to believe that if one is introduced, it is, it is safe. Yeah. But then it's, it, it's the other folks that I just, I, I, and yeah, probably the, the nine 11 inside jobs and, <laughs> you know, they're putting, they're putting microchips into my body. And I'm thinking, man, you carry a cell phone around all day with the GPS. If the government wants to know where you are, that's not a problem. They don't, they don't need to inject you with anything. <laughs> And they did that during the pandemic too. So, <laughs> so I'm I'm curious. Um, I'm curious about this then. So early on, we had you know we had certain tools in place, uh, you know, mask uh, mandates mm -hmm. and and capacity limits, and you know, try and stay this distance apart, and all very all very practical. And, and people seem to be okay with it, right? If they had to stand two meters apart while, you know, in the lineup at the grocery store, yeah, no, no problem at all. But then last summer, the province, uh, like many jurisdictions throughout Canada and the rest of the world, introduced vaccine passports. And once again, um, we, we generally saw, um, or most people, I think, generally saw that as a reasonable step, while others saw it uh, as this huge infringement on their rights, and I'm curious when you hear people say, you know, this is this is against my rights as a Canadian, and then you see them protesting outside of hospitals and these sorts of things. I'm curious what goes what goes through your mind, um, and and what you what you think this says about you know current societal discourse. Well, I think the people protesting outside the hospitals uh, says a lot more about that. Um, the this. The idea and, and the the hospitals and then I mean I talked off the top about how I'm a dad that there was um, at least one school that went into lockdown because protesters uh, tried to force their way inside that that scares me more than any people anyone who has you know concerns well well founded or not well founded about vaccines and vaccine passports those are conversations we can have but you know if you're at the point where you think your only point your point can only be made by scaring a bunch of kids. I, I don't even know where the common ground is to start talking with you. Um, and yeah. hospitals too, but you know, with kids, it was an elementary school for God's sake. Um, it's hard. I, I can't, this, this won't make for a very good answer, but I have a hard time talking about that rationally. Um, for the vaccine passports, uh, to me, if it's, understood as a temporary measure um, designed to keep us safe and uh, ensure that you know only we're not exposing ourselves to undue risk for a short amount of time it doesn't sound a whole lot different than i know you told me not to say i'm old enough to remember but i do remember <laughs> when they made uh seat belts mandatory um where i grew up in alberta and some of those same arguments were made mm. it's my car and you know if it's whatever and uh, it, you can't make me do this. And well, we kind of can. <laughs> in, in fact, newsflash. <laughs> and I suspect vaccine passports, we kind of can as well. Now, that's a bad analogy in that I hope vaccine passports are not permanent. Um, they're, they were originally due to expire fairly soon here, and that's going to be extended, obviously. Um, but I mean, if we're still, if you're still showing your, your vac status, to get into a restaurant three years from now, then, you know, we, that's a conversation we can have about, okay, it's, it's overreach and it's time to put this, it's time to put this behind us, but you know, that's a conversation for three years from now. Yeah, no. And I, I think that's, I think that's well, well articulated, um, you know, time, place, season, or, you know, these, these things, uh, 
these things matter in context, you know, in all things, context is king. And, and the reality is, uh, at this particular moment, we still have a very, a very real threat um, yeah. that we're, we're dealing with. You know, I, th I think for me, what just is so agitating is when I hear people talk about rights and they mistake them for privileges. Yes. You know, going going to the movies uh, is not a right; it's a privilege. Going out to the to the pub is not a right; it's a privilege. And um, that's where that's where I won't engage any further when someone starts talking about their rights. Uh, you know, and especially as you know, my background is of a is of a scholarly legal nature. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I teach about the Canadian Charter uh, when I teach Canadian public policy at, at a local university. So I'm thinking, man, you've never read the Charter. You don't you don't you don't know the <laughs> basics about what a right is. You don't know what what checks and balances the government has. Like I just man, I just can't deal with it. Um, <laughs> but in, in any event. The next topic I'd, I'd like to touch on then a little bit is is consequences, hmm. and I'm wondering, uh, you know, it's it's been interesting across across the country. Quebec a couple of weeks ago, um, their premier talked about implementing consequences vis-a-vis -vis taxation. Uh, I've heard I've heard all sorts of arguments, um, both for and against consequences those who say well part of the canadian health care system is that it's universal and it is what it is and then others saying you know um as far as i'm concerned if someone doesn't get vaccinated and they're in hospital then they should pick up the tab and then of course the in-between people saying you know the number of beds being occupied by individuals suffering uh from covid the majority of whom are unvaccinated those those beds are being taken up uh at the cost of surgeries being postponed so I, I, I am, I would say, to a degree pro consequence, uh, in so much as, well, you know what, actually, you're the guest, I, I'm not here to offer my opinion, I'm here to listen to yours. So, so <laughs> thoughts on consequences, McLean? <laughs> listen, no pre no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Agree with me, though. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I struggle with this as well. I um, I understand. I really do understand the frustration, and some of the arguments, um, you know, above emotions for for things like, uh, and it doesn't have to be an unvax tax, but something like that. And I still can't quite get there. I still don't think it's the right decision. Um, to me, it's it's not a knee jerk response. It's it's not something that I'm saying. You know, it's this can never happen, and it's wrong. It's just I don't. I think the the negative consequences, which we can only guess at now, would probably exceed the the net benefit. Um, and I say that knowing that you know we talk about carrots and sticks. Sticks have been effective in getting people to get vaccinated. So I'm I'm not naive about this, but I do think that taxing people or charging them um, based on their vaccination status is probably a step too far. And I do think that a slippery slope there is worth worrying about um, because it is a public health care system and the argument could be made that it's in the public's interest that you be healthy. And so it may sound silly to go from, well, if we're going to talk about vaccination status, then, you know, what about smoking? What about right. if yeah. you're if you're the drunk driver in an auto accident, um, if you're a gang member and you lose a gunfight? Um, these are extreme and uh, I'm obviously somewhat facetious examples, but once we're getting to the point where we're saying you either need to be pay more based on your, your life style and status, I have a hard time thinking it won't keep going. Um, I feel like this is a line that does need to be drawn in the sand and it's maybe it's easier to draw that line now that the, the end game of COVID appears to be in sight. Um, if this was I, I, I hope you're knocking on wood wherever you are. <laughs> I am. I'm actually sitting. I have a wood desk that I have a hand on, and I have a wood platform for my microphone, and I have a hand uh, on both. And you can't okay. see this because this is a podcast. All but right. I have every 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 limb is touching wood right now. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Good. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, imagine there was no um, if, if the if the vaccines were still just now being in, in, uh, introduced, which isn't that hard to imagine. It still would have been fast. Um, then this might feel a lot more urgent, but um, I, yes, it would be so much better and simpler if everyone got vaccinated and I wish I could make it so. I just don't think that's the way to do it. And I, I think that 
it it really does open us up to some really uncomfortable conversations that I don't want to have afterwards. Yeah, no, no, you know, you, you make, uh, you make some fair points. And, uh, you know, for me, I, I, I do find it, uh, I, I, I find it very emotional, um, mm-hmm. um, more so than I, I anticipated, but, you know, I, I, I know people who have had surgeries postponed surgeries mm-hmm. that they were counting on and it negatively impacts their quality of life and not just physically, but mentally and emotionally as well. And so, you know, I'm, I'm someone who, who believes uh, people need to take ownership. And if, if, if they're going to make a decision, they have to accept the consequences where the line is when it comes to consequences uh, relative to this, this issue. And, you know, uh, how we, how we function as a society in terms of the healthcare system, uh, you know, like you, it's, it's very, it's a very challenging conversation. Yeah, I would, I would agree. We're not there yet, but And this actually dovetails into my my final question for you, uh, which is all about essentially discourse. And and I'm seeing a society, well, I'm seeing a society that's gotten uglier and uglier. And I think for different reasons, social media plays a role. I think think, uh, former President Trump really elevated that into the the United States discourse, but, you know, that sort of trickled in, I I think, globally. but but what I want to do is when I uh, when I think about the past two years, I, I want to look at it through through a political a political lens because we talked earlier uh, uh, in the show about this idea that there was cooperation and everyone sort of laid down their arms so to speak and said you know what are we going to have to do in this global pandemic and. I think we're starting to see see that fade. I think there's starting to be more uh, politicaz- politicalization, politicalization, that's the word, <laughs> um, taking taking place. And in a day and age where where you know anyone on Twitter has has an opinion, um, you know, because you don't have to have basic decency or some semblance of critical thinking skills to sign up for Twitter. So in yep. a day and age where we have we have you know. Uh, all this negativity, negative discourse as a society, where, where does the, the, the politics land on that? Is it also starting to, to drag down or are you still optimistic that governments at all levels are, are going to keep working through this? Again, you have your finger on this, you have the finger on the pulse every day. So what are you seeing, McLean? Too political or we're, we're still okay? It's, I mean, it depends what you mean by we. Um, it's I, I think that those, you know, those early days, those heady early days of, you know, us all laying down our arms, those those are well and truly in the past. Um, and that's I mean, they're they're in the past here. They're not everywhere. Not everywhere even had those laid down their arms periods. Yeah, no fair um, points. Fair yeah, point. I mean, again, just because they're right next door um, in Alberta, it, it never stopped. The politics did not begin did not end for a moment. Uh, the opposition was relentless. Um, and that was the decision they made here. You know, I do sometimes wonder if that those that laying down their arms might have lasted longer if there wasn't a snap election during the pandemic. Um, right. It's th- where they, I, I think, quite selfishly and, and recklessly um, called an election just when, you know, the <laughs> things looked positive for the moment and and the opposition had been working with them for months um that undermined a lot of that and caused a lot of bad feelings that uh you know are still being sorted out um especially with the bc liberals and greens obviously they felt they felt they feel very taken advantage of um i would argue because they were (laughs) and so um the the trends that we had been seeing um in the decline in civility um quite independent of covid19 those are I think COVID-19 just may have accelerated them if only because it's so much, well, you know, it's so much easier to, you know, dehumanize somebody if you, you don't ever see their face, if they're just, you know, a Twitter handle or, uh, you know, a Facebook account. Um, and I, I think that the isolation and the mental health toll that so many of us have been dealing with, uh, of course, these things were, were going to suffer, but they were already bad. And we shouldn't kid ourselves about that. And if, if COVID has, has sharpened the edge, the edge was there 
and has been getting worse for years and years and years. I will never forget moving to BC in the end of 2009 and just being the shock as I sort of realized the tone of politics here was so personal and angry and all or nothing. And it took me the better part of a couple of years to just wrap my head around it. And um, it hasn't improved. <laughs> no. no, it really hasn't. It really hasn't. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, again, just, just so heart heartbreaking. I think we can all all do better. You know, it's it, it doesn't take much effort to be to be kind to be respectful, to have uh, a healthy discussion about the mm -hmm. things that you disagree about as opposed to being being on the attack all the time. Um, well, I mean, if you'll uh, if you'll let me plug our, our site for a second, I mean, that's kind of the whole premise of the Orca is that I, I say this all the time, reasonable people can disagree. I like hearing people that argue the other point of view. And like, it, to me, it's exciting when somebody, you know, makes a point and you kind of go, huh, I had not thought of it that way. That is interesting. And you can agree or not. It doesn't matter, but it's more fun. Yeah. I mean, if, <laughs> if I wanted to just, you know, be rewarded, I'd just look in the mirror all day long. <laughs> that's, that's, it's, it's great for like an hour and then it gets old. <laughs> you, wow, you can look in the mirror a whole hour. <laughs> well, an hour, three hours. <laughs> The important thing here is it's not a long time, Justin. <laughs> uh, sounded long to me. You know, I, I, I go a couple of minutes before I'm like, okay, I'm done. Oh man. Well, you know, uh, McLean, it's, it's been, it's been so great chatting with you. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that we might make this a bit of a yearly tradition. Uh, every year, it. every year in January, we'll take a second look at the year before and, and the, you know, the top news story or, or news stories of the year. Um, but for now, uh, thanks thanks for, for being here, McLean. Thoroughly enjoyed my time with you. Hey, Justin, thank you for having me. And thank you for putting out this incredible show that I'm proud to publish and enjoy listening to. And I get to listen to it before all of you that are listening. And uh, you know, <laughs> I, that's going to continue. Um, but yes, no, thank you for doing the show. Thank you for bringing your thoughtful approach. And you know, thank you for a second look. All right. Well, that does bring us to the end of this month's edition of A Second Look. I'd like to thank my guest, McLean Kay, for joining me. If you have questions or comments about today's show, feel free to email us at a second look at the orca.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website and sign up for The Fin, delivering BC news and opinion to your inbox weekday mornings. Until next time, I'm Justin Goodrich. Thanks for listening. The preceding program was brought to you by Alliance Public Affairs Group in association with Van Grio. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, please email us at a second look at theorca.ca. Thank you for listening, and please remember to like and share.